our outline for tonight. So we've been talking through stories in the Bible. Tonight we're going to look at a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16. Most Bible commentators believe that Jesus was telling a true story when he told this story. So many times when the Bible gives us a parable where Jesus gives an imaginary story that teaches a lesson, the Bible will say this is a parable, or Jesus told them a parable, or you can tell from the way Jesus words the story that it's a parable. He doesn't name the characters and and give them specific roles. It's like a man left Jerusalem traveling to Jericho and he fell among robbers. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan beginning. In this particular story, it's not described as a parable, and it doesn't start with there was a man, it's a named person. So let's read this story that Jesus shares with us in Luke 16. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about hell, an untouched, unpreached subject of the Bible. Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime... You received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers Let him warn them so they'll not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. In Luke chapter 16, we learn a little hell, we learn a little bit about Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. Some translations will call that paradise. Let's look at some other scriptures just very quickly that uh, tell us a little bit about hell. Jesus taught about hell. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that hell's a real place because that's the way Jesus taught it. And so let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You know what's even better? Don't gouge your eye out. Don't cut your hand off. Throw your life in the hands of Jesus. Let the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the word transform you so that your right hand and your right eye don't cause you to sin anymore. Amen? Amen. Because God's able to do that, isn't he? Man, that's what I want. Mark chapter 9, verse 47 and 48. Jesus said, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than for you to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell. And then he describes it a little bit. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Luke chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. So don't be afraid of people and what they think about your walk with God, and don't be afraid of persecution, I think he's trying to include. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. So isn't this interesting? Jesus teaches about hell, but he also teaches about the intense love of God and how much he cares about you. He cares more about some of the details about you than you know about yourself. So sometimes when people think that we're going to teach about hell, it must mean that God doesn't care. But here, there's a scripture that teaches us about hell, but also about the intense, crazy, close care, concern, and knowledge of God, love of God for you. 
kind of cool to see those two things together. How many of you, when you think about, oh, God knows the hairs of your, that knows the number of the hairs of your head, you think, yeah, he said that right before he talked about hell. How many of you think that like, when you hear that scripture? You don't even think that. You just think about how much God loves you, right? But it followed him. It followed him telling us a little bit about hell. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15 says, then I saw a great white throne judgment. This is in the future. This is going to happen in the future. I saw a great white throne judgment and him who was seated on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades, which is hell, gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades, hell, were thrown into the lake of fire. This will happen in the future. Hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So in the course of scripture, I want you to catch something. There's a progression. There's a development in the understanding of the place of eternal punishment in the Bible. Just as there is development in the understanding of God's salvation in the Bible. One way that I like to think of it, and uh, some uh, scholars came up with this, I don't know, 60, 80 years ago. It's just a really great way to think about your Bible. Imagine, imagine you're starting over here in Genesis, and then you're going to work this way towards Revelation in your Bible. At Genesis, if you start reading the Bible at Genesis, you have like a certain amount of, you get a certain amount of knowledge just in the first three chapters about God. It's just this little bit, right? But then as you work your way through the Bible, you just get more and more and more knowledge about God. You get more and more knowledge about his plan of salvation. You get more and more knowledge about what he's doing. And it just, this, this, this what we call the cone of revelation gets larger and larger and larger and larger as we work our way towards the end of Revelation until we have this massive amount of, of information. And when we learn one thing in Revelation, it will oftentimes remind us or take us back in our minds to something we read in the, the epistles, something we read in the gospels, something we read in the prophets, something we read in the historical books, something we read in the law, and maybe even something we read in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And we see the incubation of it here, just one little speck of it, but then we see a full description of it by the time you get to the end of the Bible. It's this cone of revelation. And here's what I want you to see. Not only is, not only is the knowledge of our salvation, the knowledge of our God expanding as you read the Bible from front to back, but your knowledge of all the different elements of the Bible expand from front to back. And that knowledge gains and grows and develops until towards the end, you have this full picture of it. And there's a development in the Bible of our understanding of what hell is and ultimately the lake of fire that's described in Revelation chapter 20. There's this progression. Death is introduced in Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning. But eternal death is fully understood by Revelation chapter 20. Is everybody with me today? Okay, so there's this progression. Let's acknowledge that. Number two, let's talk a little bit about the word. The word hell, also uh, grave, as it is sometimes referred to in the Old Testament, is a translation of the Hebrew word Sheol. Sheol is referred to as the place of the dead. It's a place that no person want to be left. It's not where you want to reside forever. And it's not described in the painful terms that Jesus describes hell. But yet, it's this place that seems to have this, this uh, insinuation that you want to avoid it. So uh, it's, it's Sheol in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus begins to describe hell as a fiery place for the wicked, but a place that the righteous will be spared from experiencing. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, the Greek word for hell is Gehenna, and Gehenna is a compound word from the word valley, ge, and then Hinnom, which is the valley that is just south of Jerusalem where they dump all the trash. Even in the Old Testament prophets, I think it might be Jeremiah, uh, they mention how all the trash is dumped in the valley of Hinnom. And so, because that's where the trash is dumped, 
and there's always a garbage fire going there, uh, it started to be known as uh, this place, uh, Gehenna, the valley that's always on fire with all the garbage. And so this is really kind of an interesting thought to, to see how this real actual place just outside the edge of Jerusalem becomes like this picture for what Jesus is teaching us about a place that people would go who have rejected God. Is everybody with me tonight? And uh, it's, it's almost like uh, there's a little bit of an illustration that's put together in that and uh, a picture for people to be able to hold on to. All the Jewish people all around Galilee and Samaria and Judea and even the places uh, east of the Jordan River, they knew about Jerusalem because they all traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of uh, Atonement. They, they traveled to Jerusalem for the uh, Feast of Passover. These Jewish people that lived all around the region, they were all used to making this pilgrimage, sometimes several times a year to Jerusalem. And so when Jesus talked to people about Jerusalem and its surrounding areas, everybody knew what he was talking about. Oh, we know that valley. That's the burning garbage dump. Like you don't even have to start a fire when you throw your trash there. You just take your trash and throw it on a fire that's already going. Because so many people throw their trash there, it never stops burning. And that's where Jesus even comes up with this picture and this description of, like, this is an eternal fire. It's always going. It, it like, lasts forever. And that, that part of the, the concept of hell that begins to be described as well. In the book of Revelation, we see, in Revelation 20, that hell is emptied and all of its contents are placed in the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the final destination of the wicked that the Bible describes. Now, the Bible says this. In Matthew, I think it's chapter 24, Jesus said that hell was not prepared for man, but for Satan and his demons. I, years ago, you guys will find this stunning. Years ago, I wrote some curriculum for new converts, for new believers, and it was real easy for them to go through. They'd read a question. They'd read a scripture that's referenced at the end of that, and then they'd fill in the blanks. And so there'd be a, a question. The question was, if hell was not prepared for man, for whom was it prepared? Go to this scripture. And I had Matthew 24 something. And uh, uh, they were supposed to look up Matthew. Uh, uh, maybe I had 25. They're supposed to look up 24. Maybe it was 24. They're supposed to look up 25. I'm going to get it mixed up because I'm just telling this off the top of my head. But, but I put the wrong chapter number. And so if hell was not prepared for man, for whom was it prepared? Well, I put the wrong reference number because I had the wrong chapter, but the right verse. Okay. And so this, this, this Vietnam veteran who had gotten saved. He was a rough dude. He was a rough dude, and he'd just been through his third divorce, and so he was calling out on God, saying, God, you've got to save my life. My family's falling apart. My kids don't know me. Uh, this, just is, this can't be the way to live, and so he just threw his life into the hands of God and got saved. And so he's just gone through his third divorce, and he's had some lady problems. Well, because I put the wrong reference, he read the scripture that said, two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. And he answered the question, hell was prepared for women. <laughs> it's like, okay. I was like, how'd you get that? And then I realized my typo. I was like, ah, wrong chapter. <laughs> so what Jesus taught was that hell was, hell was prepared for Satan and his demons. But in God's justice and in God's fairness, what he has determined is that everyone who, everyone who wants to go with Satan and his demons... Rather than going with Jesus, you get to go with them. But you don't want to go where they're going. Is everybody with me tonight? You don't want to go where they're going. And that's why J Jesus is able to say, hell was prepared for Satan and his demons. And Peter, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is also able to say, it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. That is God's will, and that is God's desire. So let's look a little bit at the story. Luke chapter 16 on here with this rich man who is now in this place, Hades or hell, and Lazarus who is in Abraham's bosom. The Old Testament wicked dead are being held for judgment from death to the death of Christ. And so this guy is, is waiting there in hell. The wicked dead of the New Testament era are being held in hell as well. Hell is emptied into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. So the, the place where people are right now, 
the place where this guy was in Luke chapter 16 is not the lake of fire. Is everybody with me today? Okay, so let's understand that. Understand this, like I hate the concept of hell. I will be honest with you, I often have difficulty with the concept of eternal punishment. Like in my small group on Sunday night, we, I work with 18 to 25 year olds on Sunday nights. Um, I'm like, let's ask the hard questions. Like, let's ask this one. And this is actually one of the questions they came up with. It's a good question. I'd read it other places. I was like, let's spend some time on that. We took a whole night and we just talked about how can God, how can God send someone to an eternity in hell for a temporary life of disobedience? That's a good question, right? How can God send someone to an eternity of hell for a temporary life of disobedience? I'm not going to answer all that question tonight. I don't, I don't have all the answers to that. But I will say that when we, when we miss the perfect gift that God gave us, I mean, Jesus, Jesus was the perfect gift for all of humanity. And I'm just telling you, he loves you. And he is not only the perfect gift for all of humanity, he's the perfect gift for you. He's not just the perfect gift for the pastor. He's the perfect gift for every person you work with, every person in your neighborhood, every person that likes you and dislikes you, every person that you know in town, and every person you don't know in town. Jesus is the perfect gift for every person. And God, our perfect God made a perfect gift for us, let's say yes to the perfect gift. And let's say yes to the gift that does offer abundant life now and eternal life forever. That's a good gift. And that gift is available to everybody. That gift is available free of charge. One of the things I think is funny, I was listening to a report on NPR. NPR is pretty liberal, I know, but I listen to super liberal news so I can see what other people think, you know what I mean? And uh, in this one report, they were talking about how um, churches are oftentimes filled with poor people because church is one of the last social institutions that people can attend that's free. Where do people go to make friends? They go to, they go to the health club and they exercise, right? Well, if you want to keep going to Planet Fitness, what do you have to do? You have to keep paying. If you want to keep going to the YMCA, you have to keep paying. And uh, I went to the YMCA for a long time until my wife got sick of me making a donation every month and not actually lifting any weights or exercising. She's like, no, nah, you're not going to do that anymore. I said, okay. And now I run for free on the Riverfront Trail. <laughs> that works out okay, too. Uh, there are so many clubs that you could be a part of. But if you're gonna be in the club, you gotta pay your dues, yeah. And the dues may be small, but you still have to pay them. Some clubs that you wanna be a part of, uh, you have to pay for a weekly meal. You gotta to go to the restaurant and pay for the meal. Well, there's a lot of people that are like, man, whew, that club's getting expensive. I pay my dues and I spend 40, 50, $60 a month going out to eat. Well, that means I don't have enough money to take my daughter out to eat or go out to eat with my wife, and, or do the other things that I want to do that would be going, all my going out to eat money's in my club. And so what do you do? You drop out of the club. But think about this. In church, in church, and for the sake of the gospel, um, you can come to church, you could come to church, and never give in the offering. Am I right? Right. And Lifestream Church is going to love you, and we're going to be kind to you, and your pastor doesn't know it. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you don't give in the offering. <laughs> I don't know if you do give in the offering. The only time I know if you give in the offering is if I'm going to hire you to be on staff. Well, then we'll find out if you're a giver. Because <laughs> you've know, you got to be fully on the team if you're going to be on the team, right? If people who give are going to pay your salary, you're going to be a giver. Is that fair? Okay. And if you're going to be an elder or a board member and you're going to be a part of setting the salaries of the staff, and making decisions about our church at that level, yeah, you're going to be a giver. So then we check. And even then, when I check, I, I go to the bookkeeper, and I'm like, yes or no question. Is this person tithing? Yep. Okay. I don't, so I don't know how much you tithe. Does that kind of make sense, everybody? And so uh, church is free. And here's the thing I'm trying to get at. Here's the thing I'm trying to say. This is the most important thing. What I want to say is 
Jesus is the perfect gift, and every person can afford him. Everybody can afford Jesus. There's like no barrier. There's no hindrance. There are no dues except that you say, God, I am yours. Here's my life. Here's who I am. All my warts, all my sin, all my mess-ups, all my hang-ups, all my faults, here I am. I'm yours. Repair me. Forgive me. Heal me. Fix me. Change me. Make me better. Make me new. I just give it all to you, God. It's free, and it costs us everything. Am I, am I right? It's free, and it costs us everything. It's free, and it gains us everything. Because not, not only am I not going to go to hell, I am going to go to heaven. Amen? And here's what I love about heaven. I'm going to get off the notes just a little bit. You know what I love about heaven? Heaven isn't just a reward. Heaven is all kinds of rewards. And what I love about heaven is that I don't just want to get to heaven. I want to gloriously get to heaven. Um, if, if all I want to do is avoid hell, I will always do the bare minimum to avoid hell. I go to church. I became a member. I confess Jesus with my mouth. I think I'm in. I soothe my conscience enough and ask forgiveness enough that I think I'm going to go to heaven. I'm avoiding hell. But listen, the Bible says that at the judgment seat of Christ, we all as Christians will be judged for what we did with our salvation. Like once you were saved, what would you do with it for Jesus' sake? How much did you love him? How far did you go for him? How much did you seek him? How much did you intercede for others? How much did you share your faith? And he wants to give us rewards for what we do with our salvation. And in that regard, I don't just want to avoid hell and do the bare minimum in my life with Christ. I want to do the maximum that I can with Christ. Because the rewards are limitless. I don't know what all they are. 1 Corinthians tells me this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what he has prepared for those who love him, but it has been revealed to us by the Spirit. And what's been revealed to us by the Spirit is that there are limitless rewards for those who serve him. And you know what? I look forward to some rewards from the Lord. Now, the greatest reward is just seeing Jesus. The greatest reward is I'm going to spend eternity with all y'all. Can I say that like as Southern as possible? <laughs> All y'all, <laughs> y'all is like a few people. All y'all is a lot of people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So that's what that means uh, <laughs> in Southern vernacular. So let's get back to hell. Heaven's awesome, amen? Amen. amen? amen. We serve a God who logically, if he's just, must keep people accountable. I mean, is God a God of justice? Yeah. He's a God of mercy and grace. He's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. If we're not accountable, then ultimately, if there's, if there's no justice, then ultimately, listen to this, there cannot be right or wrong. And if there's no right or wrong, it absolutely does not matter what you do to your neighbor. All that matters is you get everything you want. And there might as well be no God. We might as well be materialists or humanists who believe that we're just made up of stardust from the Big Bang, and there's no God, there's nothing spiritual. So if that's the case, then there's no morality, period. But because there's a just God, there is morality. And because there's morality, I want to do what pleases the Lord. So if we're not accountable, ultimately, then there must not be any right or wrong, good or evil in the universe. Hell has several purposes. Number one is accountability. Number two is a source of fear and respect for God. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, but fools despise discipline. But get this, when we're saved, so the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. But first John tells us that perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with judgment. So what does God want, to want you to experience in your life? Yeah, I'm gonna choose Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. That may be a reason for you to choose Jesus. You might choose Jesus because you're like, Jesus sounds so awesome and my life sound, feels so terrible. That's a good reason to choose Jesus too. Amen? Amen? You can do that. 
and God's working in that. But we may start with fear of God, fear of judgment, but as we, as we get to know God and we experience God, we fall in love with him. And per, as that love is perfected and growing in us, the perfect love that we experience with God begins to drive out the fear because fear has to do with judgment. Do I still respect God as my judge? Absolutely. That's why the psalmist who knew God and loved God said, with you, God, there is forgiveness of sins, therefore you are feared. With you, God, there's forgiveness of sins, therefore you are feared. That's because he's the judge, right? But at the same time, I can develop a relationship with God who is my judge that just I just fall in love with him. And I know how much he deeply loves me as well. So we, we may start with fear of judgment. We grow, we grow into divine, beautiful love, perfect love that casts out fear. So second is a source of fear and respect. Third, it's an outlet for God's holy wrath to be fulfilled on the people who have rejected the perfect gift that he has spent thousands and thousands of years preparing for us and thousands and thousands of years declaring to us and presenting to us over and over and over by the power of his Holy Spirit and the truth of his word. It's, it's an outlet for God's holy wrath. And God's wrath is holy. I mean, God's wrath is not wrong wrath. It's holy wrath. God, Listen, so God is perfect... God is perfect when he's angry, and he's perfect when he's loving. Right? He's perfect when he's displeased, and he's perfect when he is pleased. Let's put it in lighter terms. Can we say it that way? He, he's, perfect, he's perfect when he allows something difficult to get your attention so that you'll pay attention to him and be saved. And he's perfect when he gives you blessings that get you attention so that you would be saved. And let's be honest, we've had a little bit of both in our lives, haven't we? I mean, you can be far from God and have terrible things happen in your life due to sin and hurt and wounds and whatever. God has allowed those things to get your attention, but at the same time that that may be going on, he's also gotten your attention with a brand new baby that's beautiful and the, the life that he gave you, and you're like, I'm a parent. Both could be happening even at the same time in the same era of your life, am I right? He's perfect in, in both of those things. He's perfect at both extremes. And fourth, hell is an absolute opposite for the absolute perfection of heaven. It's an absolute opposite for the absolute perfection of heaven. Here's some tough questions that you can read at home because now it's time to pray. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front. I was going to do some more, but I think we're going to stop. You can take the tough questions home and just read about them, think about them, pray about them, and seek the Lord about them. How many of you, listen, how many of you are glad for heaven? I'm glad for heaven. But I think it's important for us as believers, it's important for us to, as believers to recognize that hell is a real place and that God's word is filled with information about hell. And not only should it motivate us to salvation, but can I tell you something? Hell ought to motivate us to service. What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here's how you can know how much you love your neighbor. Here's how, much you can know, here's how you can know how much you love your neighbor. How concerned are you that they'll spend an eternity in hell? Like you love yourself? Like you're concerned about your eternity? Do you love them that much? Do I love them that much? Oh, I just got to tell you, I'm preaching and convicting myself, right? Because that's a tough one. That's a super high standard that I can preach and know at the same time that I don't live up to most of the time, but I want to. I want to. And, and the thought of hell should motivate me. I am going to pray for the people on my dance card. Amen. I'm going to pray for people that need Jesus. I'm going to pray that God will send people who need Jesus to my church and my life and my small group and into my circle of Christian friends, whatever way possible, because I don't want people to go to hell. I just want to unpopulate, depopulate hell every way I can. 
Has hell been prepared for Satan and his demons? Yes. Are they doomed to go there? Revelation chapter 12 says that Satan knows he is doomed. There is no other option. He is going to hell, and he is filled with fury. And he wants to take as many of us with him as he can. Angels are different than humans. So God has not offered them salvation through Jesus. Angels, the scripture says angels long to look into our salvation and understand it. But the angels that are in heaven that are holy, it's set. There they are. The angels that are on their way into the lake of fire, it's set. There they go. And Satan is one of them. And he's filled with fury, and he wants to take as many of you as he can with him. You know what I want to do? I want to take as many of you as I can to heaven, Amen. not just with me, but together. Because it's not, I'm not so big and important that it's like, I want to take you to heaven with me. Well, man, sometimes I've got a really crummy month going on, and I just want to call Kent and talk to him for a little bit because he's my friend, because I want to go to heaven with him. Or I want to talk to John or Bud, one of my brothers in the Lord, because, God, I just want to go to heaven with that guy, and I'm pretty sure he's going. Amen? Amen. I'm just like you are in this journey, and God, I need you. And, uh, and, and then, God, I want, to take, I want to take my friends and my neighbors, I want to take people with me. And, if, and if, I'll, if, if I'm just, even if I grab somebody at the end of their life and I share Jesus with them on their deathbed, I'll take it. Amen. Whatever it takes, amen? amen. And, uh, and if I can reach somebody as young as possible so that they miss out on all the things that hell has planned for them in a life without Christ, I want to reach them as young as possible. I want to reach your kids with our kids' ministry in Kids Jam. And in rainbows, where my wife is teaching every Wednesday night. And in kids' church on Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. Because I want kids to be saved. I want teenagers to be saved. I want middle-aged people to be saved. I want old people to be saved. Because I want people to go to heaven. It's all what it comes down to. What do I do? What is my life? My life is helping people find Jesus and follow Jesus. That's like my life. I think it's my whole life. And I encourage you to join with me and, and, and let it be your life too. God wants to use you. Let's stand to our feet and uh, we're going to pray. Now, before we pray, before we pray about our church, before we pray about our dance card, before we pray about the Washington campus, the Union campus, and the Pacific campus, I want us to be able to pray for one another. And we're just going to take a few minutes and uh, we're going to ask the Lord to help us if we have a need. If you're in the, in the church tonight and you've got a need, let's just pray that God will meet needs tonight. And then, and then we're going to pray about our mission like we want to get people from a life that's headed towards hell to a life that's headed towards heaven. Amen? Don't we want to do that? Amen. We want to do that.